Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Welcome to part 11 of my review of Masks of Nihilathotep for Call of Cthulhu 7th edition by Chaosium. In this video I'll be covering the second half of Chapter 6, Australia. This will encompass the sidetrack scenario Buckley's Ghost and the investigator's journey into the city of the Great Race. We begin with the one and only sidetrack scenario in the Australia chapter, Buckley's Ghost. The players can get the seeds of this part through the gossip in Concudgery, which may cause them to look into the rumours. It takes place in between there and the city of the Great Race, and can even be an accidental encounter. The story begins 15 years ago in the outback in search of gold. Buckley joined up with Vern Slattery, who had struck a small amount of gold, and both of them employed an Aboriginal Australian girl called Jemima to look after their shack, who they were kind to. As the gold depleted, Slattery and Buckley grew suspicious and fell out, suspecting each other to be holding out on their finds. Jemima fell pregnant with Slattery being the father, and Buckley left. Slattery had actually been stashing gold, and he and Jemima lived comfortably with their two sons. Buckley, on the other hand, answered Houston's call for workers and fled into the desert when the winged creatures arrived. In 1922, he returned to Slattery looking for recompense. He waited for Slattery to leave, then confronted Jemima, demanding she reveal the location of his stash. Jemima screamed, and Slattery heard the cries and ran home to confront Buckley, shooting him. The bullet passed through Buckley and struck Jemima, killing her. Slattery, overcome with grief, dragged Buckley to a nearby cave at Dingo Falls and burned him alive, with Buckley's cries haunting him since. Slattery lives in the same hut with his two sons, Frank and Jacko. Buckley's disappearance was never investigated, and he exists now as a ghost that haunts Dingo Falls, that has been seen recently by Mad Ginger Muldoon and local Aboriginal Australians. Could happen that the investigators are already looking into Dingo Falls, however, it gives a few ways to involve them should they not have discovered the rumour. We then go on to the dramatis personae of this piece. First up is Vern Slattery, described as a miner with a murder on his conscience, a man who has turned to God and drink and maintained a meagre living. There's Frank Slattery, his eldest son of 13, a nasty piece of work who will resort to violence if required, and Jacko Slattery, his youngest son of 10, who has a penchant for torturing small animals. He has visited Dingo Falls against his father's will, and the ghost of Buckley tried to possess him, leaving an imprint on Jacko of Buckley's greatest fears. This can be discovered in his drawings, more on that in a bit. The last person named is Buckley's ghost, which haunts the site of his death. When he manifests, the noise of a harmonica can be heard, and he can be seen as a spirit enshrouded in flames, should anyone camping at Dingle Falls bring fire there. He will attempt to possess those wielding flames, though if the flames are doused, the possession will end. It then moves on to Dingle Falls itself. It is a rock formation that resembles a wave of surf, and forms a pool of water that is shades from the desert heat. The pool itself is about 15 foot across, and animals come here at night to drink. Aboriginal Australians always strain water before drinking from it, with those not taking this precaution falling sick. It is otherwise unremarkable. The place has a set of caves that contain some venomous snakes and the scorched remains of Bill Buckley. The spirits of Buckley want revenge for his murder. They can discover a small bit of evidence in Slattery's home, Buckley's harmonica and his boots for example, and they have the option of informing the authorities, though the evidence is largely circumstantial, or convincing Slattery to go to Dingo Falls. If they can trick or convince him into going there at night, Buckley's ghost will try to possess him and set him on fire. Additionally, Jack Oker get infatuated with one of the female investigators and can be effectively lured to that place where Buckley's ghost will do the same to him. Vern could potentially visit the site if he believes Jacko was gone there. Once it has exacted its vengeance, it will leave Dingle Falls forever. Slattery's hovel is a few miles east of the falls and has three bedrooms. The family live in squalor and the two clues previously mentioned can be found here. The harmonica has the name Buckley scratched into it, and the boots have Buckley burned into the tongues. Also, Jacko has some crayon drawings he has done that contain a three-lobed bat-like creature foreshadowing coming events. If Vern is convinced to confess to the murder, then this is deemed a good result. If he is lured to the falls and killed by Buckley's ghost, then it is considered a possible bad outcome, and the place will be haunted from this point onward by the ghost of Vern Slattery. We have the stats for all of the Slatteries and Buckley, and then we move on to the main part of the Australia chapter the Great Sandy Desert and the City of the Great Race. There are a number of ways that the investigators can be linked to the travel here that are listed, and it also gives us some information on the Canning stock route. It goes into the fact that ideally they should have at least two Daimler light trucks loaded with supplies for around six weeks, with water being regenerated at the wells along the way. 
The trip to McWhirr's coordinates takes around four days, with the landscape becoming increasingly desolate, with nothing but scrub, rocks and dust as far as the eye can see. As they journey, the temperature and dust are constant, dropping to freezing at night, with clear skies and views of the Southern Cross constellation. Mule and camel tracks are crossed regularly, though there is no way to indicate when they were made. Smoke can be seen from faraway fires, most likely Australian Aboriginals for various reasons. They will avoid contact whenever possible. It gives us some rules for desert survival, alongside a table of desert encounters. This contains snakes, either death adders or brown snakes, a prospector called Darby Dave who is leaving the desert due to strange things happening, odd localised earthquakes and swarms of bats. He also tells the investigators that Aboriginal Australians are vanishing. If they are friendly, he will tell of a strange shape blowing through the air at a far distance, despite there being no breeze and a terrible whistling. They can come upon some Aboriginal Australians who will actively avoid the party as they've been shot at in the past. If they can be reassured that no harm is meant, they will say that the area is dangerous and that Nagunung Nagunut has returned as a white man, drawing pictures in the sand of five circles, claiming that these are tracks that they have found. They will also draw the symbol of the sandbat. The investigators can come across a lone escapee from Houston's underground lair. She is an Australian Aboriginal and half crazed and starved who will hide in fear, thinking that they will take her back. If calmly reassured, she will tell them that she was held with many others underground where they were forced to dig. She was actually a zombified worker who, for some inexplicable reason, the effect failed on, so she ran away to avoid recapture. She can give them directions to the camp, though her information is perhaps understandably vague. Those wanting to return her to her people can do so with a past luck roll. This takes D3 days. We get a full map of the region, and then another desert encounter, car trouble. One of the tyres has a blowout, which causes panic dry rolls and could potentially require repairs. The last encounter is a sandstorm that will stall movement for around three hours and clog the carburettors of vehicles with dust. We then have details of the route that Wycroft takes. This is found on the third day of travel and can be followed, though Houston has an ambush set up on the road. It does seem to veer wildly off course at certain points, but does terminate at the shaft of the buried undercity. Should David Dodge be with the investigators, he will want to turn away from the route to reach Nimbera Well, a brackish green pond that lots of wildlife drink from. They will avoid the ambush should they follow Dodge's ideas. If they continue in this manner, following Dodge and his directions to McWhirr's coordinates, the tracks of many vehicles will become noticeable and seem to be heading directly to the location. They also have the option of turning towards Bungabini Well and making their own trail there, noticing it is less well travelled. This could cause damage to their vehicles, but they will end up at the second entrance. As they get nearer to the city of the Great Race, they need to pass through a ravine where an ambush has been set up by cultist lookouts. When they see a vehicle, they fire at it from range. If Houston has been alerted to their presence, there will be two snipers. They are both in well-stocked, shaded hides and swap several times per day. The shots at the car may not even be noticed for a few rounds, though the scenario was played out here over three rounds of the trucks taking fire. There are, of course, pulp rules for exploding trucks. Should the investigators spot the snipers, they have a number of means to take them out using stealth, intimidation and spot hidden. If they are captured and interrogated, they can learn that the road ahead ends in the middle of fields of strange stones and a hole that leads underground, where there is a great cave and that demons haunt the darkness. They will also find out that Houston is a visionary, directed by a god, and that he has made holy idols that will help him open the gates of heaven. The sniper is clearly insane, and if persuaded, will even lead the investigators there himself. The next section is ominously named Death Camp. This is a camp of a dozen tent shells that are huddled together alongside stacks of crates, a shack marked explosives, and an old Ford truck. It's clearly a former mining camp with no signs of life. A good roll can see bones amidst the sand and rubble, and a club that is embedded with small sharp teeth originating from bats. Inside the small wooden building there is a deep shaft that contains an engine and a cable winch and elevator. This can be operated but only travels around 200 foot before stopping at a mound of rubble that blocks its path, a dead end. The camp itself has many interesting features. The explosive shack is empty apart from two boxes that used to contain dynamite and one intact tent which has been sewn back together that is used by Jeremy Grogan who may even be sleeping there. It contains many household items such as empty food cans, matches and lanterns. There's a dark spring of water that has been conjured into existence by Jeremy Grogan as he is a dreamer and investigators can spot a number of strange tracks that have encircled the camp. Each track has five toes and they are around six foot long. Cthulhu Mythos roll will determine that this is from a flying polyp. They can head towards McWhirr's coordinates, and from here they will eventually find the entrance to the city alongside another ambush. It then shifts focus to Jeremy Grogan. He can either be found in the death camp or wandering nearby. 
Investigators can be alerted to his presence by the sound of animal yelps, and he can be found being accompanied by around half a dozen dingoes. They respond to Jeremy's wishes and will stay away from the party. Should the investigators pursue them, they can follow the tracks of the dingoes, and they will eventually come upon a naked man wearing only a pair of Oxford-style shoes, who is sat in a five-foot-wide circle of stones. He will warn the party away, accusing them of being Satan's spawn, and it will take a good role in order to get him to understand that the investigators mean him no harm. If he is unconvinced, the dingoes will bear their teeth in warning. Grogan has a strange affinity with animals, and the pack of wild dogs is strangely loyal to him, protecting him if attacked, though gunfire makes them skittish. If they patiently question him, he will give some information which is detailed here. He can tell the investigators that Carver, i.e. Houston, is responsible for the camp and he believes that he took the men, trucks and dynamite. He will tell them about crude, tooth-covered clubs that they wield and it is clear that he is scared of them. If he feels the investigators are friendly, he will beg them to rid the land of Carver and will recognise a photograph of Houston as being Carver if shown. If, however, he is bludgeoned with questions, he will become sullen. He will refuse point blank to go along with them under any circumstances, retreating to his circle of stones, claiming that they protect him, which they actually don't. It is noted that Grogan is a dreamer, and even though he is insane, he is able to unconsciously change reality like a dreamer using the dreaming skill, though it is completely random. After they leave the camp, they need to head northeast to reach Houston Settlement and the second entrance to the city of the Great Race. The next section is City Beneath the Sands. It details the multiple methods that the investigators can find it, and then moves on to Houston's main entrance. If they've followed McWhirr's coordinates, then they find the strange rock pillars, with the difference being that the sand has been tightly packed due to footfall on vehicles. Should Wycroft and his daughters have arrived, then there are several light trucks parked outside. There is a shed there that surrounds an electrical generator and a set of wooden stairs that lead down. The noise of the generator can be heard in the desert, and as far as Houston is concerned, this entrance is the only way to the city. There is always a single guard on watch here. If the stone pillars are studied, then they are determined to be around 10,000 years old. They are pitted and eroded by time, and the design is strange. Should they scout out the area, the investigators can find a hillock nearby that can be used to spy on the cultists. The investigators are presented with a number of methods of gaining entrance listed here. If they are expected for any reason, the entrance is well guarded, though the stone blocks jutting out of the sand provide ample cover. The investigators may decide to create a truck bomb and send a hurtling towards the entrance, and it gives some rules for how it could be done here, though it will undoubtedly draw the attention of flying polyps that are a few miles away. There is a map of the entrance, which has a scale included should it turn into a firefight. It also details the second entrance. If a wide arc is taken past McWhirr's coordinates, they can find a cave that has no tyre tracks near it, and has some weathered stone monoliths that have faded carvings on them. It has tracks outside that are the same as the flying polypons from earlier, and the carvings can be determined with a Cthulhu Mythos roll to mark the boundaries of the Yithian city. The cave is a steeply sided hole that can be tumbled down but cannot be climbed out of unless they tie ropes to the monoliths. The dust in the labyrinthine city is very thick and sticks to clothes and skin, footsteps are muffled, and it is oppressive and claustrophobic. If the players take a compass and follow it, then they can eventually come upon the strings of lights and the electrical generator noise that has been installed by the cultists. For a general description of how the city is, we are given a page of selected passages from Shadow Out of Time. The next section is called Into the Unknown. At this point, there are two entrances that they could have gone in via, Houston's and the cave. The city itself is a continuous structure for miles and miles. Firstly, we cover Houston's entrance. The stairs are around 300 foot long with electrical lights strung sparsely throughout that provide some illumination. At the bottom of the stairs, there is a backup generator alongside several 50-gallon petrol drums with a winch mechanism that can be used to lower them down. When underneath the sand, the temperature is cool and it is as silent and still as imaginable, filled with dusty grand halls and the tiny motes of light of distant strings of light bulbs. The place is overrun with bats and their guano is nauseating and overpowering, requiring a con roll to prevent a penalty dice. Loud noises or explosions will cause them to pour out of every entrance in their thousands. Also, potentially, there'll be snakes drawn to the opening of the cavern every dusk and dawn. It gives us a portion of the vast city roughly mapped out, with every pertinent place labelled. At some point in the city, each investigator will require a sand check to even comprehend the immense age and size of the place. The city itself was actually not built underground. The upper levels were destroyed by eons past, with the dust and the ages covering it all. The lower is mostly intact despite the occasional collapse. Houston initially failed to tunnel directly to the important part of the city, so Niall Athotep led him to a nearby entrance, though they are a fair distance from the path that the crawling chaos advised them of. The buildings are connected by strangely inclining great ramps of octagonal stone, bordered by walls and fallen earth. 
the city in a maze of rooms, completely empty of life, and filled with strange, gigantic furniture, art and artefacts. A successful Cthulhu Mythos role will confirm that they are Yithian in design. The distances in the city are colossal, and rubble blocks lots of pathways, though the strings of light bulbs can be seen and navigated with. The sense of ancient foreboding in the city is palpable. The machines are unfathomable without the ability to read Yithian instructions and are awkward for humans to use, though if they have visited Grey Dragon Island, some of them may be familiar. The city is built for massive blocks of stone that can be destroyed by explosives, though it would attract flying polyps who are incredibly tough opponents. After this we move to encounters in the city. The first up is the shaft into darkness. The investigators, if coming into the city via the second entrance, can eventually come upon a deep shaft that is around 15 foot across that blocks their path, obviously created for some purpose. On their side of the shaft there is a great lockable lid replete with strange alien latches that can be swung over the shaft to form a bridge. This requires a combined strength roll and takes D3 minutes. Unless they dampen the noise of it swinging over, a flying polyp can be attracted from below, and if it is not secured it will blast its way through and attack the investigators. Flying polyps use tentacles and wind attacks and ignore most physical damage, as well as being sandblasting. Unless they are equipped with a lightning gun they could face a very smart, malevolent and incredibly tough opponent. Should they get beyond this shaft they will journey downwards to the black basalt city where the polyps live, and in the distance is a single light bulb. As they get nearer to it, they hear a petrol generator and the ancient darkness is oppressive with the whistling of the polyps. They need to follow the lines of light to make sense of the city. If they journey via Houston's main entrance, they will eventually come to the bunkhouse, the place where the cultists live. It is a series of four rooms with each holding ten cultists. They are filthy and decrepit, containing obscene art, artefacts and bones. It is here where they can find a cryptic set of orders from Houston, where he refers to the two-legged deer, which is open to the interpretation of the investigators. The bunkhouse is always busy and noisy and is never guarded unless Houston gets wind of the investigators and sends out groups of five cultists at a time to hunt them down. The entire area is connected by lengths of light and as such Houston has people in charge of keeping the generators fed with fuel, line walkers. These strings of light have clear human traffic through the dust and the line walkers are easily evaded by ducking into the darkness. They patrol every 12 hours wearing a miner's hat and each day one of the generators is stopped and serviced. They all have good knowledge of the light in the city, and they all carry lightning guns to prevent flying polyps from being bothersome. We then move on to the great plazas. There are two, red and blue, that are gargantuan hexagonal halls that are completely featureless. The blue plaza radiates blue light from the floor, the red plaza radiates red light, and each of them is around half a mile across. The last is the Purple Dome Temple, a 2,000 foot across marvel that is generally intact after around 100 million years buried under the sands. A perfect hemisphere it is entered by archways that are equally spaced all around the grey floor. In the centre there is a smaller 500 foot hemisphere that glows strongly with purple light that shimmers occasionally as if alive. Its function is unknown, however Houston believes it is some sort of alien power source and plans to tap into it. Sticking out of the sand here is a gnawed human femur. Outside the glowing hemisphere is a block of stone covered in dark stains and there is evidence of a fire on the floor. Behind the stone is a 25 foot tall statue of Nile Atatep in his bat aspect, constructed from tree branches and human bones, wrapped in cloth and daubed with paint and blood. Flanking it are statues to other gods such as Cthulhu, Azathoth, Yogg-Sothoth, Cthulhu and Shubnagorath. In addition to this there are guardians of the sandbat nearby. The statues are life force batteries that when touched drain D10 power and half of the person's current magic points, which is then stored in the statue of Nile Atatep. They are being stored in order to facilitate the opening of the Great Gate in January 1926. Houston is reluctant to use any of the magic points stored here, but will do so if needed. Should Houston be killed or captured, another acolyte will be trained in its use. If the Eye of Light and Darkness is used here, it can shut down the power contained so that it cannot be used in the ritual. After this we have a section on the Lightning Gun Model B. These are highly dangerous experimental weapons that look like a period camera. Originally created by the great race of Yith, there are a number of versions and these particular ones hold D20 plus 3 charges and they are not rechargeable by the investigators. They are two-handed weapons that do 2d8 damage with a 25% chance of hitting and multiple charges can be used at once to boost the damage, though there is a 5% cumulative chance of burning the weapon out for good if this happens. The range is 100 yards with a penalty die added for each additional 100 yards and the damage is lowered by 3. At point blank range, the attack roll has a bonus die. The weapon also does impaling damage like a firearm. It is recommended that the keeper should assign each lightning gun an individual number of charges and keep track of them privately. It then goes on to the subject of Nitocris in Australia. Should she support Carlyle's plan, she will be the first person to replace Houston should he be killed, if there is time. 
Additionally, she may travel to Australia to keep an eye on Houston, as his progress in the city has been erratic, threatening the entire plan. If Nitocris is against the Great Gate opening, then she may even travel here to interrupt Houston's dig in order to take the Yithian technology for her own schemes, and could possibly even join forces with the investigators to accomplish this. Okay, so we move back to the Purple Dome Temple and the three horrors that lurk there, the Guardians of the Sandbat. These monstrous half-bat, half-toad-like creatures with featureless heads live here. These are the strange, circling, bird-like things that the investigators may have spotted at a distance while heading to Concudgery and also mentioned in McQuarrie's diary. When ceremony to Nailathotep are being performed, they ensure that their dark master receives the greater share of the sacrifices. When entering this area, the investigators need to make a group look roll. If successful, the creatures are outside. If they are present, they start staring when anybody enters the hemisphere, and a Cthulhu Mythos roll will determine that they can be placated by touching the statues. Should they decide to leave the statues alone, then the Guardians try to capture one investigator each and press them against Nailathotep's statue until they die. They will not pursue those that flee any further than the walls of the hemisphere. Of course, being pressed against the statues causes huge magic point loss. The creatures are gifts for Houston from Nihilathotep and follow his commands. They are responsible for the raids on Australian Aboriginal settlements and are the cause of their numbers dwindling. We then move on to the cult rituals. These are performed weekly and quarterly. The weekly ones involve building a small fire on the temple floor and chanting, which causes thousands of bats to wheel about overhead. These three victims are sacrificed in a sand bat club gauntlet. The clubs are coated in a particularly foul concoction created by pounding bats to a pulp in a huge mortar and pestle and mixing it with vomit, then putting the sun to fester. It is then sieved, chanted over and stored in labelled jars. The goo goes into cuts and welts and causes the victim to begin to blacken and bloat almost immediately. They are then bound to the statue of Nalathotep and drained of magic points while in a state of torment. A hard medicine roll can give someone who has been tied there a con roll to survive. The quarterly ritual involves a sandbat itself. When this is performed, the glow of the purple dome fades and Houston performs a ceremony in darkness to honour Nihilathotep in this aspect. A side effect of the sandbat appearing causes all those observing the ritual to be able to see clearly in the dark, which is sand draining but ultimately quite handy. As per the other ritual, the gauntlet is run and around 19 people are sacrificed. Some who are bound to the statue are implanted with larvae from the guardians and these children born from both male and female hosts are dangerous monstrous hybrids. We have a box out here which discusses Nihilathotep in his form as the father of all bats. When it appears, it resembles a gigantic bat with a single three-lobed burning eye. It has writhing tentacles beneath its wings, a trail behind it when it flies through the sky. It is also known as Fly the Light or the Haunter of the Dark. It is sensitive to light and can only endure dim light such as starshine. The ability it gifts to humans causes sand loss as it changes their perceptions of the universe and even blind humans can see in the dark. If damaged badly enough, it will change into the bloody tongue form and then disappear. Next, we have the nursery. This is a dark pit encircled with electric lights. Moans, cries and foul smells are emitted by the pit. Nothing but ripples akin to water can be seen without more light. If a flashlight is shone down the pit, then they see the horrors of the monstrous hybrid born from the larvae of the Guardians, which causes a big sand hit and the noise to become deafening as those in the pit think they're about to be fed. At a certain point on the map, the investigators get a sense of unease and a foul stench fills the air. They may even believe that it is a plaza that is not as well lit as the others, but upon further investigation they discover it is a huge stone ring pressing down on a gigantic organism, the like of which its body size can't even be estimated. It is a mass of throbbing veins and massive swellings that causes sand loss upon viewing, though thankfully it is inert and does not react to them. This may even be the mythical thing known as Budai from Johnny Bigbush's tale earlier on. The next section is Houston's headquarters. It is marked on the map as a set of intersecting lights and is mapped out here. It is a wooden frame building that has three stories and lights are visible on all three. The ground floor is a store of mining equipment, spare electrical generators and carts for carrying equipment. Three lightning guns can also be found here and a sealed locker contains 48 sticks of dynamite alongside drums of petrol. If the investigators fail a luck roll, there are ten zombified miners sleeping here. They are victims of a mind control device that Houston has. A single cultist oversees a group of five workers and they follow simple commands. Though they are ineffectual with ranged weapons, they are powerful in melee, and they won't react to investigators here. The middle floor is reached by a ramp and has seven steel cages, and the locks are magnetic. They contain many prisoners, mostly Aboriginal Australians, and they begin moaning when the investigators enter. If Houston is on the top floor, he can hear the cacophony of noise and investigate. Any investigators who have been captured can be found here, with half hit points and D10 sand loss. One cage contains the bloated victims of cult rituals, and on a failed group luck roll, one of them is currently giving birth to a green, wart-covered reptilian thing that causes sand loss. 
The cages are foul-smelling and buckets outside of them hold raw food and stale water. The top floor entrance is covered by a heavy drape and upon investigation it is divided into sections for scientific experimentation, eating and sleeping. There is a long desk facing the doorway and hundreds of great race document cases are heaped against one of the walls. The cases hold documents in Yithian. Should Houston be here, the investigators may surprise him if they sneak in. However, he will rise from his desk, welcoming them with a curious expression on his face. He will offer them refreshments, then ask about current events in the outside world. He will happily chat away as long as the subject is kept to science and history. Undoubtedly, the name of Niall Athotep will be mentioned, and he will offer to show the investigators the secrets of the universe, and if they play along, will take them to the Purple Dome Temple and explain his plans. Once he has done this, he will ask them to lay their hands on the statue of Niall Athotep and pledge their undying loyalty to the crawling chaos. He is clearly an evangelical lunatic. If he is threatened, he will not hesitate to use his powerful magic against them, most especially dominate a mind blast, and will call upon his cultists to capture them for sacrifice. If the investigators get to search this room in Houston's absence, when he is performing a cult ritual, for example, they can find many interesting things. Next to a typewriter among some papers, there is a letter from Edward Gavigan, pictured here, as well as a forty-five revolver and a lightning gun on the desk. There is also a bowl made from a material similar to copper, inscribed with runes. This is used in the spell Send Dreams. There is also a marine chronometer, the same as the ones found in other places such as Omar al Shakti's home, Juju House and Grey Dragon Island. There's also a metal helmet with three protruding wires that end in triangular pads that are placed on the head of the victim in specific areas. When the device is activated, the wearer must pass an int roll or suffer the effects of the device. It was originally created by the Great Race to block memories of their possession of people brought from the past mentally. Houston uses it to wipe out long-term memories from captives. It can be figured out in a few hours by those with a scientific bent. In the desk drawer there is a 600-sheet manuscript called Gods of Reality. It is Houston's journal that he's been writing since entering the city. It can be skimmed in around 30 minutes, though it takes a full day of reading to understand correctly. In this work, Houston declares that the universe is so relative that no sane human can imagine it, and that humans teach themselves to not see the truth as a method of self-defence. He claims that the truth seeps into consciousness through dreams. He records most of what he has achieved in Australia. He talks about the great race and their artefacts that he had worked out how to use and sent to Edward Gavigan in London and Sir Aubrey Penhew in Shanghai. It also mentions Grey Dragon Island and the Mountain of the Black Wind, describing in detail what will happen on January 14th, 1926. And he tells of the storage statues in the Purple Dome Temple, how the mind controller works, how lightning guns work, and he also explains how he managed to pull a Yithian forward through time. Excerpts of his ramblings are detailed here. It then moves to Kakakatak's chamber. It can be found by following a chain of light into three grey stone lined rooms that are decorated by some indecipherable Yithian symbols. In the first room there are strings of electrical lights and many spare electrical parts. Those with the proper training discover that much of the gear here is of very advanced earthly manufacture or alien design. A few can be recognised but it would take weeks to fathom out what is here. The second room is 40 foot across and contains a huge black control board covered in all manner of dials, handles, displays and relays with lights and gauges. There is a leather daybed here, those most associated classically with speaking with to a psychiatrist and an operating table that has body restraints, and a chromium headset similar to the one in Houston's room. It has no use in the campaign, but can be used in a pull campaign with the rules over leaf. The third room is about 50 foot across and mostly empty. A long high bench holds many alien artefacts and instruments. Across the room is a shimmering force field that causes huge damage to those who try to pass through it. It can be switched off by throwing the fuses in a locked fuse box. Behind the force field, in the shadows, is Kakakatak, a member of the Great Race of Yith. When she becomes active, she will pick up a blocky metal device and speak to the investigators telepathically, though this can be resisted. She will ask that they turn the force field off, giving instructions on how to. If they do, Kakakatak thanks them sincerely, then glides away and out of the campaign. Should they make a deal with Kakakatak in a positive manner, she can telepathically impart knowledge on a variety of sciences, an additional detemper investigator in a few hours. She can even impart knowledge on how to fight flying polyps. She may also tell them how to rewire the zombifier so that the miners can be returned to normal. In addition to this, she reads Houston's mind daily and tell them all about Ho Fang, Arja Singh and the Penny Foundation and also knows how the conspiracy is set to work, all the important locations and who can be trusted and who can't. When she's freed, she can take the investigators to a dusty, unexplored building and give them several fully charged lightning guns and will explain how they work as well as taking one for herself. It'll be clear that she fears attacks by flying polyps. She will request their aid to get through the rubble in the city, as she needs to locate some archive that she desires. One thing of importance is that Kakakatak will bargain with the investigators in complete good faith. 
It's clear she has no fear of the potential opening of the Great Gate, and she can impart her reasons why she's not troubled due to knowing the future, though we'll mention that the future is not set in stone, and this is a potential timeline. We then move on to the conclusion of the chapter. If all has gone as planned, Houston will have been foiled or killed, Kakakatak freed, the miners freed, and the cultists defeated. They should end with the investigators in the desert, hundreds of miles from civilization, with potentially no means of travelling back quickly. Grogan's spring can be used to help them survive until one of the cattle drives comes past, or even surveying prospectors. On January the 14th, 1926, the ritual will begin, and Houston will take part in it if not stopped. It gives a list of rewards for the chapter, including one for defeating Niall Athotep as the father of all bats. And lastly, we have all of the stats for the characters and all of the monsters in the chapter. Okay, that concludes part two of the Australian chapter. The next part will be part one of chapter seven, China.